Welcome to Wake Up the Echoes, presented by TireRack.com. I'm your host, Tony Simeone. Great show this week. We had Marcus Freeman as well as Micah Shrewsbury stop by the show and had a conversation with them. A little bit later, got the secondary involved as Benjamin Morrison swung by the set and had a good conversation with our co-host, Isaiah Dunn. Finally checked in with Julian Love of the Seattle Seahawks. He and the Hawks are off to a great start. That makes me, a Seattle native, very happy. So a ton of great conversations on this week's show. Let's talk to the two head coaches, Marcus Freeman and Micah Shrewsbury. All right, Coach Freeman, second show of the year, and we brought along a very special guest, man. a guy that has the man. the man, is that what you're calling him? The man. Coach Shrewsbury, welcome to your show. You guys kind of share this show, and I'm excited to have you guys share the couch. How does it seeing each other across from one another on the couch right now? Yeah, it's great. I mean, we haven't done this before, but yeah. it's my guy, man. Okay, before we get started, I'm grabbing a Dasani out of our Yeti cooler. Do you guys want anything, or just I can go by, by myself here? You got it. I got, got it. it. I got us coming. <laughs> Dasani, I want to say, new packaging, really nice. We were talking before, it kind of feels like a lighter, more refreshing Dasani water this year, so I'm loving it. Um, okay, let me start here. I have actually a really good icebreaker. Last week, I had Jaden Thomas, Notre Dame receiver, on that couch, right where you're sitting, and I asked him this. He played multiple sports in high school. I want to get both your reactions to this. I said, he said he played basketball. I said, what position did you play? And he said, well, I was a defender. And, be- <laughs> and before he could get another word out, I said, no, hold on. Defender is not a position. That is a type of player. And I just immediately called him Reggie Evans. So is, is <laughs> when you hear someone say defender, I'll start with you, Coach Shrews. Yeah. What goes through your mind? Because that means all of a sudden I don't have a position. I'm, I'm just a, a piece on the chessboard that's not very useful except getting in people's way. I'll right? give you a great story. Speaking of defender, right? Uh, we're in practice with the Celtics. And Isaiah Thomas is playing defense or doing something, and, and a guy scores on him, like Jay Crowder or somebody scores on him. Okay. And they're like, no, somebody else scores. Say Marcus Smart scores. And Jay Crowder is just talking mess to him the whole time. And Isaiah turns and looks at him and said, that's what you're here for, <laughs> defender. <laughs> it's so... That's probably what Jaden Thomas was doing for somebody that could really play offense on his high school team. <laughs> oh, now I understand what his role was. Okay, Coach, who is? do you know who the best basketball player is on the football team? Shoot, it might be Riley. I've seen some, oh, I've seen his, mixtape, yeah. Some of his tape, his highlights. He can he can play above the rim. Yeah. Um, all of them act like they can play. Yeah. They all act like they can play. None of, and all of them are probably defenders. You know what I mean? <laughs> Guys that can't shoot, they can make layups and get rebounds and try to stay in front of somebody. Yeah. But, um, yeah, that's probably is that's what he means by being a defender. He can't shoot. <laughs> it's so true. Do, do you know anybody? If, did anybody play football on the basketball team that you're aware of or no? Absolutely no. No. <laughs> do, I, I Don't want to take a hit? I don't think so. Like, you know, we play basketball for a reason. Hey, one, it's indoors. It's probably too hot. <laughs> too hot or too cold to be out there. And then, like, the physicality and the hitting part, like, that, that will retire um, basketball players really quick. So I, I think I asked you this last year, Coach, but I just want to get a refresher. Like, when you see the two-sport athlete or, the, or somebody that plays both sports, do you think is that something that is an added benefit that you see? Okay, there's some coordination. There's something with basketball that might help them on the football field. Yeah, I love watching football players that play basketball. And there's a competitiveness that they show um, – and there's an athleticism skill set, but most of them are just football players that are playing basketball. I've seen very few, like, basketball players that are football players. Mm. Does that make sense? Like, yeah. you're a legit basketball player. Like, they all claim to be, but none are legit basketball players. I might have seen one or, one or two in person. But um, I love it when you see football players on a basketball court because you can see a lot in terms of, you know, how competitive they are. You know, are they really athletic you know, because, you know, you get on a basketball court. If you're not athletic, it'll show. And so, uh, but I love, I love to be able to go watch those guys play basketball. I feel like too with basketball, it's to be there's a coordination level and also the no, the no helmet for me. Like I, I don't know, can you see body language better, Coach Shrews? Like, can you tell body language better without the helmet on? I don't know what your thoughts are. I think you can, you know, and you can sense it, you can feel it. You know, like, you know, I wear my emotions on my sleeve, right? You know how I'm feeling. You can see that in basketball as well, too. You can see it on people's faces, how they react and what they're doing. So um, that part is good for us, right? You might be able to hide it. You might look at somebody's body and they can they can disguise it. But 
when you can see some emotions and, uh, you know, some angst, like you, you can tell it when they don't have a helmet on. It's something that I have enjoyed about both you guys watching on campus is you seem to really enjoy attending or really following at least each other's programs. Um, I'll start with you, Coach Free. I, I see you courtside a lot. Mm-hmm. Like, what about basketball? Why do you want to be at the games, both men's and women's, all the time? Well, one, I'm a fan. Like, I love Notre Dame athletics. Um, me and Coach Shrews have a, a close relationship. And so, one, I want to support him, but I'm a fan. I want to see his team win and have success. But I get caught up at times watching him, you know, because coaches watch coaches. And I watch the way, you know, he reacts and he interacts with his players. And it's really interesting watching a basketball coach run the show. Um, it, it's awesome. I, I text him all the time after I, I watch his teams, man. They they take after him. You know, they play really good defense. They're tough. They compete. Um, and that's how he runs up and down that sideline, man. He is – he's one to see, man. I was going to ask, so when you when you watch him, what, what do you take away most? Obviously, he's a very active coach on the sideline. Is that your takeaway, or what are you focused on? No, I just think he's he, – to watch him run it all. Hmm. And I know – I'm sure there's, there's other parts to it, but – to see him be able to tell maybe both sides of the ball what they're playing, the passion he has. I watch him kind of interact with the referees a little bit. You know, interact. Those, is oh, all, that's inter- a very diplomatic you know, term. Interact. interact. We're just interacting, yeah. you know, just talking to him, make sure they know we're there. It's like what we're doing right now. We're all just <laughs> interacting. <laughs> but I love it, man. I love it. And uh, it's contagious. Mm-hmm. It, it is contagious. Yeah. And you can see it uh, with the way his team plays. What about when you watch – the football team. I know, I, I think I remember when you talked to the team, it was last year, right when you took the job, yeah. just you've always been a big fan of this program. Now you get to be so close to it and watch it. I assume you're maybe even feel an extra connection to it. What do you see when you both watch the team and then watch Coach Freeman on the sideline? Yeah, it for me, like like you said, I've, I've grown up a Notre Dame football fan. And uh, that part of it is right first, the, the cool factor of it for me. Mm-hmm. Uh, but then too, like you get to know the guys on the team, right? So as, you know, as the day's going on and you're seeing guys walking back across campus and going over to the football building or leaving practice and just interacting with those guys, saying hi to them, like, you know, giving them a fist bump, like encouraging them, like, mm-hmm. because we're all here for them, right? We all want to see them have success. Yeah. And, uh, that's one of the best parts for me. And then like, I love going to practice. And because it's fascinating to me, like I only have, you know, 13 scholarship guys. Right. And then we have a few more walk-ons, whatever, but that's all I have to deal with. They're like, he's got like a hundred guys. Yeah. <laughs> like, how do you get all of these, all of these different areas on one page? Hmm. Right. Like this group is going to be successful only because that group helps them. And this group and that group and like, how do you mesh all that into one? So that's why I love practice. That's why I love watching and seeing like it truly is like, you know, he's a CEO. Right. Like, and well, that's, you want to study that. You want to keep growing in your profession and like studying CEOs and what they're doing. That's what, that's what Marcus is doing right now. Coach, we've talked in the past, but the thing you miss about being, let's say a linebackers coach or even a coordinator is that you're, you're further separated from the position groups mm-hmm having a hundred players or a hundred plus, like what is the toughest part about having to be on top of all a hundred people as opposed to being in that room every day? Yeah. You miss that intimate relationship that you have with a group every single day. That now is the coaching staff, right? We meet every day. That is your, your position group, right? And, and, and that's really an extension of you, Mm -hmm. right? That's where to, to, in order to get 120 players on the same page, your 10 coaches have to all be aligned and we have to make sure we meet and talk about exactly what everybody's going to do at every minute of practice and, and meetings and stuff like that. But I miss more than anything that the relationship that you can have with your players every day, Yeah, you know, and cause a lot of my meetings with the players are, are intentional about some specific reasons, right? It's not like you go in there, we're going to be watching film for an hour every day. And so we can joke and talk about the kids and all these different things. You know, my meetings are so intentional. Then you get a team meeting that's eight minutes long. Yeah. And you can't really joke. Here's the message. Here's what I'm trying to get across. And we got to move on to the next thing. And so I miss that. I mean, obviously, there's a lot of things that I'm able to do as a head coach that um, I wasn't able to do as a coordinator or, or a position coach. But I do miss that intimate 
meeting and setting with those guys every single day. I want to talk to both you guys about recruiting. It's obviously an interesting topic at any time. Certainly the landscape, the way it is, it's evolving and even more interesting. I want to specifically dive into the idea of having a child that's being recruited. You have your son who you coach now. He went through the recruiting process. You have a son that's being recruited for wrestling. So Coach Shrews, what do you remember about that process? Obviously your son now plays for you, but just as a dad, seeing him go through the different stages, how did that affect the way you view the recruiting process? And then you've got a guy here who's going through it on the wrestling side with his son. Is there any advice, any takeaways, tips you want to share with him? And then also a father of a 14-week-old who might, <laughs> in 2042, Recess likely day, be yeah. coming to one of you guys looking yeah. for a, a scholarship to you know hold hold kicks or be a defender. Yeah, <laughs> um, yeah it's it's a little different because you know my my kid, my son was the same sport. So there was an automatic assumption that he was automatically just going to come and play for me. Mm-hmm. So nobody really recruited him. And no matter what he did, you know, uh, he could score 30 points a game and there'd be 50 coaches sitting there. Mm-hmm. They'd be like, good game, kid. You're going to be a good player for your dad, right? Like, <laughs> and, okay. and a lot of that was, you know, in college basketball, so many people have coached their own sons. Mm-hmm. And – uh so ended up working out for us. But that recruiting process, for me, kind of the advice that I always say or always talk about with um, kids that we're recruiting right now mm-hmm. is, like, I want to recruit, I want to recruit kids, like, I want my son to be recruited. Okay. Right? So, like, how I'm recruiting you is how I would want some other coach to talk to my own son mm-hmm. and do and build a relationship and, and sell him on. So um, that's what I'm thinking about, right? I have two high school age kids and every time I sit in the living room or every time somebody comes into my office, I'm like, how would I want my, I want them to be treated the same way I would want my kids to be treated. Mm-hmm. And um, you can tell a lot about people when. Can I ask a question? I Abs- no, no, I you, you can ask as many questions as you want. You I guys, like, what is it like coaching your son? Like, what is it? Do you try to be different? Do you, I just, I, I like, is it different coaching your son yeah. versus 11 or 12 other guys that aren't your son? It's, uh, so it, there are parts of it that are different. And there are parts of it that are the same. Mm-hmm. So I don't treat him any different. I probably treat him worse, <laughs> right? Mm-hmm. Like there, there's something that's built up there mm-hmm. that just you expect a lot from him. So like if, if he don't take the trash out on Tuesday, then like, you know, <laughs> he's getting yelled at for like not jumping to the ball. But like if somebody else doesn't jump to the ball, I'll be like, hey, man, come on, we got to jump to the ball <laughs> next time. When he does, it's like the worst thing on earth, yeah. right? Yeah. And, and uh, that part of it. I, I think it's harder on him than it is on me. Mm-hmm. You know, because he put a lot of pressure on himself last year to like prove that I'm more than just his son, mm-hmm. and and he struggled with that until he got comfortable, and then he he kind of you know started you know being better, started getting better, started doing, started playing the way he normally plays. Yeah. But I think that pressure on him is more than it is on me. I lose track of it, right? Like there's. Our staff helps me. You know, I don't know. Like, I'm I'm focused on our team and what's next. And they're like, hey, man, your kid just scored 27. He's being interviewed on ESPN. I'm like, oh, yeah. <laughs> I forgot about that. Yeah. You know, like, yeah. that's pretty cool. Do you find time to be dad? Do you try to be intentional about that? I try to be intentional about um, outside of. So the one good thing that his mom loves is he still comes home. Mm-hmm. Right. So he comes home and has dinner. Um, he still comes home and does stuff. Uh, but I try not. It's hard because yeah. he's so invested in our team also. But I try not to, you know, I definitely don't talk about basketball, like strategy or whatever. But, um, you know, he always wants to know about recruiting. He's always constantly wanting to know about our next opponent, things like that. Um, so try as much as possible to not talk basketball. Mm-hmm. So it's like, so he does say like, I can come home, right? I can't hold a, you know, him getting blown by on a defensive assignment. Like 
I can't hold that. <laughs> it just might not go well. <laughs> yeah. Like, no, no, no. You're third in line to get in line for dinner. Like, you're walking you can stay home. Stay in front of your man. Yeah. Walking <laughs> home in December in South Bend. Uh, that, I remember we talked about it last year. It does seem like such an interesting situation to be in. It was, it was fun to watch the dynamic kind of evolve throughout the year, too. Like you said, especially after some of those great games. As a dad, did you did you ever go back and, like, when you watch the tape or the highlights, you know, I know you're breaking it down, but do you get a little extra sense of excitement? Like, that's my son that went for 27 or no? Yeah. Okay. Maybe in five, ten years. Yeah, we'll that, that maybe. Down yeah. the line, I think I'll look back on and say that was pretty cool. But, like, I'm so caught up in the moment mm-hmm. of, like, what's happening. Like, man, how are we beating Georgia Tech tomorrow? Mm-hmm. That's all I was thinking about, right? And, like, you know, you know if he had 27, great. I, you know, if Jr. has 27, awesome. If Marcus has 27, great. Like, I feel the same way about all those guys. And then maybe down the line, mm-hmm. I'll sit back and, you know, the, the sickle in me will be gone and I'll start thinking about the, the dad moment. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to just get an update from you on your summer, busy summer with Team USA. And then also, I think I saw you, were you in the locker room after the Celtics title. Just what was the summer like for you? What were the highlights? Yeah, uh, USA was, it was busy um i was gone for 21 days Hmm. i was you know doing the trials practices in colorado springs and then we played in argentina um and won the gold there for the u18s Mm -hmm. um came back from there luckily i guess luckily because they won but the celtics lost i wasn't able to make a playoff game they lost a game in dallas while we were in argentina so i'm like that means there's gonna be game five so I landed, was here for a day, then went to game five. So I was there when they clinched it, and which was a great experience. I was in the locker room. I got goggles. I still got victory goggles okay. hanging up in yeah, hanging up in my office. But to be able to be there for that, to yeah. see those guys and then uh and then we went to Spain. You know, so uh a ten day trip to Spain. Uh with our team, which is a great team bonding experience and we played three games. And then that rolled pretty much right into the season. So, like, it's been nonstop since last year, right? <laughs> right. Like, when I took the job, it hasn't stopped since then. But, uh, you know, I got to sit on my couch for a little bit yesterday. So that was good. <laughs> there you go. At least one day. All right, last topic before I let you guys both get out of here. I want to try to take a pulse of where your teams stand on – the topic of basketball, and I, I'm going to come at this. I'm assuming maybe you'd hear it, maybe you don't, Coach Freeman. I assume you hear the discussions. Like your team, your your players now are, are young, 18 to 22 year old Gen Z, who I find myself every passing week being able to relate to less and less. Do they talk about like who is the best basketball player of all time? And when you're hearing it, I'll start with you. you I'll start with you, Coach Shrews, because you probably hear it more than maybe you hear it in your locker room too. Like where are they coming down right now? What are the names that you're hearing? that they think is the best basketball player of all time, and, and how incorrect are they? It makes me feel old, um, you know, because I grew up Michael Jordan, right? Like, that's who was playing when I was there. But now these guys have all watched LeBron or Kevin Durant or Kobe in, like, you hear a lot of that into the conversation, right? So who they're saying, um, now it kind of ebbs and flows of, who they think it is, but there's a lot of those three. And, and then there are some definitive, like, no, man, Michael Jordan is the They're guy. still in there. They're, yeah, there's okay. still some. So they're not passing around they, the video. They've probably never seen him or never watched him play. You see all the videos going on, like, Mike couldn't go left. <laughs> Just yeah. like, okay. yeah. Michael Jordan couldn't go left. All right, yeah, that's news to me. I don't know what you're talking about. What do you hear in your locker room, Coach? Oh, it's either Jordan, Jordan or uh, LeBron. That's all. Uh, you know, our guys are. They ain't quite like his guys. Mm-hmm. Where they know basketball, our guys think they know, so it's either Jordan or LeBron. I think the young guys that say Jordan, their dads are probably uh, like, hey, you're going to love Michael Jordan. We're going to watch The Last <laughs> Dance. You're going to watch this, you know. And uh, I did that to my kids. I made them all watch The Last yeah. Dance with Very good yeah. parenting. Yeah. 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 And uh, so we did that. Um, you know, we at coaching staff, they argue all the time between Jordan. Well, who do you have? I'm a Jordan guy. You're from Ohio, or – I, I know, and I love. I think LeBron's just—he's unbelievable. Right. He's like unbelievable to still do what he does at his age. He's older than me. I couldn't imagine. Yeah. I couldn't imagine. Yeah, and to still play at this high level, um, 
But I just, I'm just i just choosing to just always say, I mean, yeah. Jordan, I grew up yeah. with Michael Jordan, watching him on uh, Channel 19, WGN, or there you go. when I was young, yeah. just watching Michael Jordan play basketball. That's, that's what I got to say. It's hard to beat. I mean, I, I hear the debate all the time. I've seen LeBron's whole career, too. It's just like, but I remember Michael Jordan. I'm, I'm, I'm old enough to remember Michael Jordan. It's like, I think he's the GOAT. So yeah. I don't know. I'm sure we'll get some comments on that. LeBron's on real. You're probably a, a couple episodes from now. We'll talk about the goat defender of all. Right? <laughs> <laughs> Reggie Evans. <laughs> Reggie Evans is my guy, man. It's, when he was on the Sonics, just get in the way. The guy, uh, Holiday, right? He's one of true Holiday. He's, well, he's no, that's a true. Yeah, lockdown. Yeah. I mean, who, okay, who do you think? We can do right now. Greatest defensive basketball player of all time. That's all. Wow. Uh, I mean, really good rep. Probably very good stats. Gary Payton. Oh, right? you can't have the glove nickname the glove. not be a defender, right? Look. What about Ben Wallace? Ben Wallace, yeah. Block shots, rebounds. Yeah. And I mean, you know Rodman's probably yes. Rodman's oh, in Rodman, there too. They're all they're all on the yeah. first team, right? First team all D. I, I think so. so. Maybe yeah. Dikembe's in there. I don't know. Protecting the rim Maybe. for you. Yeah. I don't know. See see if the, your teams know any of these names. Are they Gary Payton? Do they know Gary Payton? I think so, because there's a Gary Payton Jr. Playing currently, yeah. and th- and that's how you know we're all getting old. <laughs> Guys, thanks so much for coming by. Always love talking to you. Glad we got you both on the couch at the same time. Awesome, thank, thank you. you, man. Thank you for having us back. Um, I'm Isaiah Dunn. I'm thankful to be back on this podcast with Benjamin Morrison, aka BMO. Thank you for having me. Yeah. All right, before you guys get started, this is our cooler conversation presented by Yeti. So before you jump in, Isaiah, do you guys want anything to drink? I got last week. We got. Dasani, we got Coke products. You drink soda in the season? I don't. Coke Zero? I don't. Dasani? Yeah, I'll, I'll get some water. Water. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll get some water too. Thank you. Get somebody's gonna drink a Coke by the end. Thank you. <laughs> Me neither. Yeah. Not yet. All right. Well, thank you for coming on, Ben. I mean, I know you personally, but I'm so excited for the people watching to get to know another side of you. Mm-hmm. A thing that I really want to start off with is something that is very unique to Ben that I've not yet to see someone else on the team bring about is your dream board. Yeah. So at his house, um, on his board, he has all of his dreams from when he was a little kid. And I want you to kind of go dive deep into what those dreams are and how that's carried you through your journey. Yeah, I think so. Junior year of high school, um, I found out how to get hip surgery. Um, and this is the time in my life where I was like, oh, like, snap. But I don't know what my life's going to look like because football is, was pretty much everything I like. I thought that was my identity at the time. But it's really not. Um, so I was just like, oh, like, I can't play football anymore. Like, I don't know what I'm going to do. Um, so that's kind of where I started finding my relationship with God, kind of. And I was just like, you know, I'll make a dream board. And, like, like kind of, like, lay out how I want my life to look. So I have, like, high school, the goals I want to uh, accomplish. And I have, like, college. Um, and I have, like, pre-draft, draft, uh, NFL, post-NFL. And I, I literally, like, like looking back at it, it's kind of crazy. Because I think I all my high school uh, – uh, goals I've I have a goal check next to that. I've I checked all those off and then for my college ones I have two more left and I had like maybe 16 to 18 um and my last one was I put it's crazy I was 17 I put become a football captain at Notre Dame mm-hmm. and that was in like the the ones I was like, I don't know if I could do that um but I ended up doing that so I checked that off so I have two more things I got check off um, and I would have completed all my goals for uh my my college segment and then so yeah all right hold on hold on can I are you allowed to share what the two that are left? Or they, I'm a, are they I'm private? Wait, I'm gonna wait so you get until, until I get it, and then, I'll, and then I'm gonna I'm gonna show okay. the the whole collection. Okay, so just to follow up, so on this board you've hit everything. Yeah, yeah. So this is a hypothetical question, mm-hmm. then, but what's gonna be your response if there comes a time like you, you might not have been named a captain yeah. this year? What's your response gonna be if you don't hit one of those? I think that's so cool about having the board because like you achieve for such high things. So even if you don't like it, I try. I, I attempted to do it. Okay. Um, I think that's the biggest thing is I, I wouldn't, I, I wouldn't be a fifth. I wasn't a captain or stuff like that. I mean, I, 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 I wanted to achieve it, and if I didn't, those reasons why I didn't, and then I could hopefully achieve it next year. Use it as motivation. Yes. Okay. Gotcha. Right. And what I want to move towards through that board. Have you checked all of these off? It's it's insane to look at. Mm-hmm. By the way, the board's awesome. Uh, that's why I wanted to bring it up. But with all the early success you've had in your high school and college career especially, what are the challenges and advantages that come with being Benjamin Morrison? Yeah, I think the biggest thing was coming on early. Um, to uh, I, I came in the summer, so it was, it was an adjustment for me with the school 
Um, and then getting thrown into football, um, playing, starting playing my third game of my freshman year. Um, and then when you have that success, you kind of like, at a young age, you, you kind of put added pressure on yourself, um, which just wasn't needed. Um, I'm happy that I went through the things I went through because you, you feel like you got to get an interception every single game um, after following up the year you had. Um, but that's just added pressure on it, it. At the end of the day, like that stuff, it matters, but it doesn't. If you give your best every single play, good things will happen. Um, so, I mean, I think for me, it was the biggest thing that I like learned was just like being like being gentle with yourself. Like, don't be hard on yourself. Like, you're what's like, what is yours is, is going to happen. Um, and then when I started realizing that, like the game just became fun again. And I feel like I just started playing high school football, elementary school football when your parents drop you off and you're just going out there with your boys. And that's what it feels like this year. That's why this, I'm having so much fun this year. I love that. And it brings me back to what you said earlier about being gentle with yourself. We talked about this. We have Bible studies every Thursday, and he's yeah. brought that up. And your relationship with God. Mm-hmm. And I know personally that your dad's a pastor, which is awesome. Yeah. Can you touch upon that, how that learning through Jesus, through your father and your family with the close connection has brought you to who you are? Yeah, I think this, it's been a cool little, like, relationship um, just because, like, one, he's my dad. And also, like, you grew up just, like, wanting to be like him. Um, he he played in the NFL for some years, so I saw I see his helmet um, in the house. So, I mean, that was, like, the first thing. I was like, wow, my dad played in the NFL. I was like, this is, like, where I want to be. So he's always been, like, my role model. Like, he's always been, like, the dude who, like, I've strived to be, like, to this day I still try, strive to be like him because it's, like, the family man he is, how he leads our family is truly special. Um, and then as you get on, you're like, wow, like, my dad's, like, you see him leading men to God. And, like, at a young age, like, you don't, like, realize how, like, important that is. Um, you just, like, oh, like, dad's talking to someone else. But, like, for him to do what he's doing is it, truly special. And I'm like, wait, like, let me see, like, let me let me see what this God thing's about. Um, <laughs> and it was kind of tough at first because, like, I mean, when, when you start having those talks, you got to be very vulnerable. And I'm not trying to tell my dad some things. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I, I struggled at first, like, being open up, like, opening up to him and stuff. But now... As the years gone on, like that's my that's my that's my my best friend really. Um, he he helps me so much, uh, not just be a great football player but a great man. He told me one time he was just like, I can't fail you um, as a father. I'll fail you as a father if I if I allow you to get all the success on the field and not make you become the best man you could be. And that was like one of the turning points in my life. I was like, okay, wait, I can't. All this stuff on the field matters, but I can't allow it to be like my everything. Um, that's what he taught me is how like football isn't isn't who you are. Um, so yeah, that was pretty cool. I just want to give a shout out to your dad yeah i appreciate it i hope he knows because ben has brought us all closer to jesus christ he's that. done a phenomenal job so your work that you put in with him has definitely paid off and i hope he knows that. that's great yeah he's my he's my he's my I dog know, i remember you were talking when we talked for the spring game the audience of one yeah you want to elaborate on that for those that don't know yeah i mean just coming in freshman year you you're you for me at least it was just like you felt like you had to please so many people um and like it it, it became my sophomore year. Like I, it was tough for me a little bit. Um, I did a good job like covering up a little bit, but some days it was tough. Like, sure, dang, like I'm not, I'm not having the the same success as I did. So I was like, like some things like may not work out. But then I was like, okay, like, like my going back to my dad I was just like, hey, like why do I play football? I play football because I love it, and then I got to give God all the glory through what I'm doing. And there was times I got away from that, and it would just be like, dang, like what am I doing? Hmm. Um, and then there's times that you you're 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 doing everything you're supposed to do, and you still don't feel right. But like it's just like. The I say like I'm just like st- like striving to like to become like a righteous person. I'm not trying to be perfect, and I, that was my biggest like problem at first. I was trying to be perfect, like being someone I wasn't, um, and that and I found myself doing things I shouldn't have been doing, but then ultimately led me to where I am today. Hmm. And that's the key, right? That's where the stress started going away mm-hmm. from you, and I see that within you in the locker yeah. room where you're not striving to be perfect anymore. Yeah. You're just striving to be the best person you can be. Yeah. And I'm just I'm so happy for you. Who you're becoming. Yeah. 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 You want to talk top five? Let's do it. All right. You had this question. Who are your top five cornerbacks in the league right now? Uh, right now or just? Right now. All right. Now. All right, I'm going to go with Pat Sertan. He's he's locked at one. Him and Joe Ramsey are interchangeable, so I can okay. say 1A, 1B. But I'll go him at one, Jalen at two, Sauce at three. Okay, sauce. Um, you would have. He was. He played here the year before you got here, right? So you didn't see him. He was no. I, I no. I didn't see him. I was in high school fair. still. You're watching on TV. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> sauce at three. Uh snap. This is tough. J. Uh, Jalen Johnson. Okay. Okay. Uh, more on the Bears at four, and then fifth, I would say. 
Jair from Alexander? Packers. Yeah. Okay, who's your top all time? Uh, I'll t- uh, I gotta go with Daryl Green is, is up there. Okay. Probably put him around. I'll put I'm, I'll put him at three. Daryl Green at three. Start. I'm gonna start with three. I don't know why I did that. I'm gonna start with three. Cause I, <laughs> top three is good. Yeah. All right, oh. and then I'm gonna go with uh, I'll start back at one. <laughs> I'm losing track. Where where are we? All right, let me guys start. Three. All right, my top my top five all time. I'll start out with Dion at one. Darrell Revis. Okay, I was there. We go. Revis is out there. Um, Daryl Green, Champ Bailey, he, mm-hmm. and Charles Wilson. Yeah. I was gonna say Revis. Like Revis had a run there where it was just Revis was Revis dominant. It's, it's like Revis, I man corner dominant. But as a corner as a whole, I think that you can't leave out Woodson. You can't leave out um, Champ. Champ Bailey is probably one of the most gifted corners I've ever seen. Yeah. Um, he did it for a long time too. Patrick Peterson, Pat, Pat Peterson, too. yeah. Um, Wilden, yeah. Pat P, he's <laughs> that's your guy, too, yeah. Right, that's, your area, yeah. I, I ain't gonna lie, I gotta put him at my one A. One A. I'm Boy. sorry. So we have to start this whole. Yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll, get, we'll take a quick break though. We're gonna come back and play a game. All right, let's okay. do it. All right, it's time for our spinning your wheels segment presented by Tyrac.com. Second week, week we've done this. Jaden Thomas did pretty well last it, week. Did he? Great. Yeah. yeah. Only missed, I think, one. Quote, one. we're going to have Benjamin Morrison spin the wheel. We'll find out which game we're going to play. All right. Give it a big spin. We just kind of did a draft. We're not going to do it. Let's try it All again. Right. Okay. This or that. All right. So it's kind of, you know, the obvious would you rather, but this or that, okay. right? So we're just going to give you an option. I'll have Isaiah. You're going to answer second for your opinion, but it's kind of okay. rapid fire. Okay. You know, what would you rather do, this or that? Okay. okay? I've got 10 here we can Embrace debate. All right, this or that. Beat an opponent by a lot or beat an opponent on a last-second play? By a lot. So even if it's pick six to win? Yeah, by a lot. Okay, by a lot. Wants to be dominant. Do you agree? Last-second play. Okay. Practice early in the morning or late at night? Early in the morning. You like to get after it, get out of the way. I the same way. Early in the morning, absolutely. Yeah, you guys are mature. As you get older, you want to get the workout out of the way. That's how I feel. Okay. Oh. Tackle a prime Notre Dame Audric Estime, oh, which you know, or and I'm not getting an era here, just Jerome Bettis. Oh, uh, they're both. Can I pick or? Oh, uh, <laughs> <laughs> or I'm gonna, go, I'm gonna go with I'm gonna go with Audric. Wow. Yeah, I'm gonna go Bettis. Yeah, I'm going Bettis because you know he's my era, but I get it. He's your teammate. Yeah, yeah, he's your right. teammate. It's fair. Okay, play in 40 degrees. Or play in 90 degrees? From Arizona, so I, I'll go 90. California, 90. Yeah, absolutely. I've been on the field the last couple of times, just pregame. Yeah. And the, the tur- when it's especially the tur- it's hot. It is. It, it gets is. hot. When you get out there, do you do you feel it? Or you- I do. Okay. It's mainly like warm-ups you really feel, but then once the game starts going, you yeah. so and okay. and all that stuff. Okay. Here's an interesting one. Would, would you rather, or this or that, win an NCAA, NCAA championship or win a Super Bowl? It's a loaded question. When you're NCAA, playing for Notre Dame. NCAA. Yeah. Okay. Fair enough. NCAA. Yeah. Super Bowl sounds fun too, though. Yeah. Uh, score a touchdown or get an interception. Why not just do both in the same <laughs> yeah. play? It's my reaction. <laughs> <laughs> You've done it. Yeah. So pick six. Yeah. Pick six. Right? Yeah. Okay. Uh, okay. Kind of a similar question. Play in the rain or play in the snow? Mm, snow. Snow. Easily. Fun? Yeah. Way more fun. Was it? Two years ago, it was pretty snowy. Yeah, Correct. it did look pretty cool. Oh. oh, this is a good one, I think. Have a shoe named after you or an award named after you? Mm. Shoe. Okay, so if they came to you and they said, we're changing the name of the Heisman Trophy, and it's going to be the Morrison Trophy, you're still taking the shoe? I would go. I would go. <laughs> we got, yeah, I, I knew I'd get into flip yeah. after I put it like that, right? Absolutely. I thought shoe as well, and then I thought, man, I think no, a word. I word straight. Simeone? Okay. <laughs> Two more here. Oh, this is just a straight up question. I think we covered this last year a little bit too. What's the toughest position on the field? Uh, Quarterback and then corner. Quarter and then corner. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's interchangeable. You, you go either way on that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I go quarterback or nickel. Yeah, we talked about that a lot last year. That like corner, you're just oh, on your own sometimes. No better fix it. You're you and, one wrong you step, you. you're exposed. <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay, last one. If you could pick any position to play besides the one you do play, mm-hmm. what would you pick? Um, 
Probably left tackle. I mean, I, I think I would play left tackle. Joe Alt really inspired me. Really? Yeah. Seeing the way, I mean, it's kind of the same movements. It's really the, footwork is yeah, coming. Same about? movements. Um, it's kind of one on one as well. So, do you feel like offensive linemen maybe get a bad rap sometime for not being as athletic as they really have to be to play those positions? Before positions. coming to college, I would say so. But then you come to college, you see someone like Joe Alt, and you're like, "Wow, this dude is a freak." A freak athlete. I mean, I think the like the now everyone's learning in the NFL yeah. too. Watching him, it's like you realize that guy. He's not just a big guy. Yeah, he's a big right. guy. Yeah, he's an amazing athlete. Hundred percent. Yeah, that's a great call. I yeah. I love that you said that. I wouldn't mm-hmm. thought. Oh, receiver, no. running back. Oh, I get in the end zone. No, I want to. I want to run him behind me yeah. for two hundred yards. Yeah. All right, that was great. Perfect, Benjamin. Thanks for coming by. Appreciate you stopping by the show, thanks Isaiah. Me. Two for two. I'm loving it. You're coming back next week. Coming back. All right. Better than ever. Sounds good. Thanks for coming, Ben. Guys. Thank you. Okay, we're now joined by a very special guest, member of the Seattle Seahawks, undefeated Seattle Seahawks, Julian Love, former Notre Dame Fighting Irish defensive back. Great to see you. How are things going out there in Seattle in Seattle for you right now? Things are going well. Obviously, 3-0 no start. Feeling good. The team is, uh, has some juice going into next week, playing Monday Night Football. And so, yeah, we're in a good spot right now. You mentioned, I was talking before we, before we started, you're out there on the east side. I grew up in Capitol Hill. What's it like living in Seattle, the greater Seattle area? I have a fond nostalgia for that area. It's beautiful this time of year, especially just what's your impression been of the Northwest so far? Yeah, it is beautiful. I feel like when I was signing out here and I was moving out here, you know, all you hear about Seattle is just rain. Uh, so I'm like, oh, it's going to be gloomy. It's going to be rainy. And then I got here in, it was around like April and I was visiting at the time. It was Pete Carroll um, in his corner office at the facility. It was a sunny day right over Lake Washington, eagles were literally flying around in the air. I'm like, what is this place? It was absolutely gorgeous. And so it's beautiful. I mean, like this time of year, it's 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 stunning. Um, and so the rain, I, I thought was overplayed. Uh, I haven't experienced any of that, but uh, I've really enjoyed it. A lot of good food, a lot of good people uh, out here. A couple things. So the rain, I agree with you. It's a little bit overstated because volume of rain. There's not yeah. a ton of volume of rain. There's just frequency of rain. So I believe the stat when I was in high school, I think we set a record 41 consecutive days at one point where it did rain. But the, so that's a lot. That's a lot. But it wasn't like it was coming down. It just drizzles. It mists. It's not exactly that. right. That's exactly right. I In the morning, it'll be like maybe a mist in the air. Uh, and you don't really feel it. You, it looks like it's kind of wet outside, but you don't really feel it. Um, yeah, I heard that stat too. I think in Chicago where I'm from, uh, it rains more per year than it does in Seattle. Yeah, so. it, that's exactly right. It probably rains more like one storm sometimes in Chicago than maybe mm. a whole month in Seattle. So you go outside, don't need an umbrella. It's one of the best places to be. Um, Ooh, they did tell me if I have an umbrella out that I'm a tourist. Some people exactly tell me. Right. <laughs> I don't think I took an umbrella anywhere in I, yeah. 18 years living in Seattle. You just get up, you walk out the door, you'll be fine. Exactly right. And so no umbrellas. I had to settle in quick. Let's talk a little bit about uh, Notre Dame football. We were talking before we started here. You said you've been able to watch each game. Uh, the part of this team that has stood out to me the most is the secondary, and I think you're the perfect guest to talk about this because of your time here and how good you were on the back end. Uh, the first name that comes to mind for me is Benjamin Morrison. Just when you see him on film, when you get a chance to watch him, what impresses you most? Because it seems like he's a guy that's going to also have a lot of success at the next level. Yeah, I think you know I saw him first, just like all of us, uh, his freshman year. Just making a lot of plays. I was think I was I was at the Clemson game uh, when I think he had two picks and one was returned for touchdown. Yeah, uh, and I was there. I was like on the sideline doing some stuff with the uh, the network, and I'm like man, this kid's a stud. And I was excited. And you know, uh, I love to see a DB from Notre Dame succeed. And so I met him at that time, and I, I've talked to him a few times since. Um, and I think what stands out to me about him is that, you know, sometimes you can cast lightning in a bottle. I feel like as, as a player, sometimes you just, this is all working for you and you're making plays, you're doing your thing, but what lasts is kind of the process of how you can go about it. I think that's what stands out so much about him is that he's really in tune with his craft. Like he is so locked in uh, on a technical level. I think that's what will help him just transcend kind of anything he's at right now. Uh, and so I love seeing him play. I love seeing him in his in his uh, in his bag uh, because he's I think going to be special for a long time. 
we were talking on the radio broadcast the other day. Just I, I was remarking to Ryan Harris, who does the analyst work with me. I said, I haven't called his name a lot this year. I think that's a good sign. It just means people aren't throwing his way. They know that's a bad idea, right? As a corner or someone in the secondary, if you see if that starts to happen, it's not coming your way. That's usually a good sign, right? Yeah, for sure. Uh, that's a great sign. That, you know, people don't want to test you, don't want to run that risk. Uh, yeah, I've been noticing that too. They, they don't test his side uh, as much just because he's so technically sound. I think he's very much in tune with how to be a corner. Uh, and it's impressive. He's been here for, for years in a row now, which is uh, so great to see. We also saw a couple guys get on the field. I know in the Purdue game, younger guys that they're excited about the future. I don't need to comment on necessarily who was out there, but you played early as a freshman. Just what do you remember about getting on the field early in your career and how valuable it was for your development going forward at Notre Dame. It was huge. Um, be, having that chance, I, I feel like I'll never forget it. You know, I, I came in as a, I think a three-star, um, but not towards the high end of my class. We had a lot of studs in my class. And just trying to find a way. Uh, just trying to find a way to get on the field. And I ended up getting on the field first out of anybody. And I think what I took from that was, one, that after a few games, I'm like, okay, I'm meant for this. Like I can play football. Um, you know, it might have been sometimes freestyling, just trying to <laughs> figure it out as a as a young kid. Um, but I belonged. I think that's the first thing that guys need to realize. Like as soon as you see in game action, it's all the same stuff. Um, and then it allows you to kind of get to that higher end of playing ball sooner. So a lot of these guys, you know, young kids, freshmen, sophomores, uh, who got some of that action, I think it's huge. Now that you can be like, okay, let me build. Let me get to that next level um, quicker as opposed to, you know, a few years and then getting to it. Um, and, not, yeah, I cherish some of those games. Some of those games uh, early in my career were so memorable because I was experiencing it off the first time. Uh, and so, yeah, a lot of uh, a lot of nostalgia thinking back to that year. I want to talk about your career a little bit here because that was around the start of my time in Notre Dame. So I remember it pretty vividly, but now I know we're getting old. It's, it seems like it's further and further away with every passing year. What's the play or the couple plays that come to mind that are the Julian Love highlights at Notre Dame? I have a couple written down, but I want to know what you uh, first. Julian Love highlights? Okay, I, I for sure have some of the ones you have written down. Um, so it was my sophomore year um, is, I think, a main one because uh, I think it was week three, maybe week four, Michigan State, Michigan State. Uh, caught, a, caught a pick and scored uh, against Brian Lewerke. Um and that was such a cool moment because, you know, I was playing offense my whole life. Uh, and that freshman year, not playing on that side of the ball was kind of weird. Um, just, you know, you're, you know, you're a different side of the game. You're not scoring. And, like, weirdly enough, when I got that pick six, my entire family was in that one corner. I, like, my now wife, my parents, uh, some friends were in that corner I scored on. And so everyone literally gets to, or got to see that that moment for his hand. And so that was super cool. That's, that's up there. I'm sure that was on your list. I had that one. And I also had the NC state one. The NC state one was great. I think also because of the call, Mike Tirico gave a, an all time call. I thought it was like, love 30, love 20, love gone. Just so good. Uh, and that was, really, that was really a good one. impression. That was really solid. Yeah. <laughs> it was mid level, mid level, but that, I mean, that was a great call. Um, and yeah, that game I think was uh, as you say, it was having a great year up to, up to that point, and we just blew him out of the water. I think that was the first pick the NC State quarterback through that year, yeah. maybe two. I think yeah. I think Trico mentioned that in the call. It's why he's all time great. Yeah, who was that Ryan Finley? Yeah, he had a, a huge streak of not uh, throwing picks. Also, if you go back to your Michigan State one and see how much about the broadcasting game you know, do you know who called the Michigan State pick? This one's tougher because you don't play on the network that much. Wait, it was Fox? Uh-huh. Uh, I don't know. I can't Guess think Johnson. of it. Gus Johnson was on that one? Let it rip. He was like, Julian Love! Touchdown. Yeah, this down. Yeah, that's exactly right. That was a good one, too. Pick six calls. Yeah. That Oh, that was a great call, too. Julian Love! Yeah, that was good. I mean, the band, our band was right there. I should have, thinking back to that, I was you know so young, and I feel like in that moment, I just blacked out. Yeah. Just catch it, just running. Um, I should have jumped into the the band. I should have just pulled a full blown Golden Tate. 
yeah. that just jumped into the band at Michigan State. It would have been good, but you know, you live and learn. Yeah, you live and learn. You take it forward. Um, <laughs> I want to ask you one more question just about, I think it was last year, this past December, you guys, you and your wife had your first child. Is that correct? Yeah. Yes, we did. So I just became a dad 14 weeks ago. Congrats. Um, thank you. Congrats to you and your family as well. My understanding, though, is that you had the baby on a Friday and you played a football game on a Sunday. Now, our baby was, uh, I think he showed up on a Thursday. I was still in the hospital on Saturday. So how did it go going from the delivery room to the football field in what, like 48 hours? It was the most chaotic thing. And so just to tee it up, it was December. It was like late December. Um, we had a stretch of tough games. We had like San Fran, Dallas, San Fran again, and Philly. Um, and the, our son was late. Um, and so we thought three weeks ago, like she was so inside that he was going to, he was, he was ready, ready to come out. And no, every weekend I was playing game, then like hurry home. No, every weekend. And then, so we played Monday night game against Philly, had one of my best games of my career. Um, and the induction date was that Wednesday. And so right after we were kind of getting prepped for the hospital, we're in the hospital Wednesday, got turned down because they were short staffed. Went back the following day, and then thirty hours later, thirty hour labor later. So I was in the hospital that whole week, um, and my wife just a, a trooper. Uh, we had the baby Friday, trying to figure out. Okay, we play in Tennessee um, Sunday, and so baby was born Friday. I spent that night in the hospital. Spent the day pretty much most of the day Saturday. Didn't practice at all with the team. Obviously, football wasn't on my mind at the time. And the team, like, I was ready to play. My wife okayed it. Important. Uh, she okayed it. What the record show? It, the record show. She she okayed it. Uh, and they flew me out on a private flight to Tennessee. And then I started the game Sunday morning. Wow. It was just a nut stretch. I went from sleeping, obviously, in that, you know, that hospital cot. They call it a bed. It's not a bed. Yeah, the little little bench. It's a bench. Yeah. It's a bench. Or and terrible for my back. I was at the chiropractor. I felt like for an hour before that game just to get loose. Uh, then played a game and just got home to the baby. So it was just a nut stretch. And uh, but he came out healthy. He's now nine months. Um, just walking, crawling, doing all that stuff. Um, absolutely nuts. Well, I'm glad it worked out. Congratulations uh, to you and your wife and the baby. Thank you. Last one I have. Just when you think back to Notre Dame, what's maybe the one or two things you miss the most about Notre Dame? It's, you know, I always think about one thing. Um, it was, so I was in Duncan Hall. Um, if you know, that's on the, I want to say what, side of campus, of very the very end pretty much of campus by the golf course. And I, on Fridays for a game, and you know, we stayed at a hotel play Saturday, we would have to go up to the facility. And if you're around Notre Dame football for the weekend, you know, that Friday, pretty much everyone's getting there. Tailgate started. Uh, you can smell the, the, the barbecue in the air all, all throughout campus. It's packed. Everyone's, you know, taking pictures, doing all the touristy stuff. And I would walk from my dorm. It was a mile walk to the, the Goog, the facility. And just that walk, I feel like every time I took it, I was like, I don't know, appreciative of where I was. It's, you know, I was going to games at their game as a kid. And so, like, to go through, see everyone taking pictures of Touchdown Jesus, the stadium, kind of to go through all the landmarks and just walking. And at that time, I feel like I could put a hat on. I, I even need to put a hat on. No one knew who I was. I feel like they knew my name, but, you know, in the helmet, nobody knew. And so I just walk and just get ready for, you know, to go to a game and go to the facility and just take it, the atmosphere in. Uh, it was a really cool thing. I, I feel like I always appreciated at the time. And then now looking back, I just, you know, you wish you can still be doing that, making that walk uh, with you know, by yourself, seeing it all. Well, Julian, it's great catching up with you. Thanks for making some time again. Congrats on the baby nine months. It's a big landmark. So good luck going forward with that and good luck with the Hawks the rest of the way here as a Seattle kid, I'll obviously be watching from afar. Yeah, thank you. I appreciate you. 
That does it for this week's edition of Wake Up the Echoes. Thanks to Marcus Freeman and Micah Shrewsbury for stopping by. Also thanks to Benjamin Morrison, Julian Love, and Isaiah Dunn for swinging by the set as well. Make sure you download and subscribe on Apple Podcasts or Spotify. Also, if you're watching on YouTube, just smash the heck out of that like button. Subscribe. We'd love to have you come along for the ride the rest of this year on Wake Up the Echoes. One more note, these beautiful tumblers that you're seeing on set provided by Yeti. They are not exclusive to this set. They are available inside Notre Dame Stadium at all the concession stands. So if you're at the game against Louisville this week or later in the season, make sure to get your hands on one of these. They are outstanding and I love drinking my cold Yeti products out of this cooler, out of this tumbler. So grab one the next time you're in Notre Dame Stadium and until next time, we'll talk to you on Wake Up the Echoes.